All right, kids in grades one through three can head off to Children's Church. Like that, the song that was talking about the, the second coming. I heard of a youth pastor who kept falling asleep during staff meetings. And so uh, the guys all brought in extra clothes one day. And while he was asleep, they laid their clothes out in the chair and then went out in the hallway and blew the trumpet. <laughs> so, some of you fall asleep pretty regularly on Sunday mornings. We might do that to you on Sunday. Oh, man. Hey, I want to tell you a few things that are coming up here at Calvary. Uh, first of all, the first Sunday in May and the first Sunday in uh, June are going to be special uh, combined services. So the, the uh, uh, 9.30 service and the 11 o'clock service will be at the same time for you. Just come as normal. Uh, that was more of an announcement for the people in the early service. And um, May, uh, we're going to be, uh, for the next few weeks, just talking about the subject of encouragement. We're talking about it on Wednesday night uh, with a study on Barnabas. And uh, today we're going to be talking about encouragement uh, in, in when you're going through seasons of fear. Uh, but for the next few weeks, these are just some things that are going to be coming up. Encouragement when you feel alone. You can be in a crowd of people. You can be around a bunch of people and still feel alone. Encourage when you're attacked. We're going to look at Psalm 3. Lord, how they are increased that trouble me. Many there be that rise up against me. Just a wonderful psalm. Uh, encouragement when you're overwhelmed. Psalm 61. Uh, when my heart is overwhelmed, lead me to the rock that is higher than I. And encouragement when we feel insufficient. We're going to look at the life of Moses and how God called him to do this great big thing. And he was like, I can't remember. He made all the excuses of why he couldn't. And we feel like that sometimes when we're asked to do a big thing. So those are the things that are coming up here over the next few weeks. And uh, we're going to go ahead and talk about encouragement because everyone is afraid sometimes. That's what we're going to talk about this morning. But before we do that, let's pray. Father, we love you, and we're just thankful because of your great grace to us. How wonderful it is that you loved us. You did not abandon humanity. You did not leave us and, and, and forsake us to our sin. But at great cost to yourself, you've reconciled us adopted us into your family and we can be called your children we can call you father truly is astonishing we thank you for the price that was paid in our behalf because we could not have ever brought ourselves back to you you had to come to us i pray that this morning that uh, and over these next few weeks as we look at the subject of encouragement that we'll find our hearts encouraged uh, to live a godly life uh, in a world that's just crazy and, and, and i pray that we would have our faith uh, firmly grounded in you so that's what we're asking for. It's a work that only your spirit can do. We can't do it for ourselves. And so we're asking this in Jesus' name. Amen. You can imagine, and we're going to be talking about the story of Gideon today. And the scripture says that an angel of the Lord came and he sat by a tree and just kind of watched what was going on. And every few minutes as this angel sat by the tree, the angel of the Lord, um, there's a wine press there. It's kind of a big pit in the ground. And every few minutes, a head would pop up out of the ground and look around like this, like, a, like some kind of a, a, a mole or a groundhog or something. And the angel would watch some more. And sure enough, a few minutes later, this, this, this head would pop up and look around. And it was this guy, Gideon. And, and we know from the story that what he was doing was he was down in a pit in a wine press and he was threshing wheat. Now, if you don't know uh, much about agriculture, and I confess that I do not, okay, I have to research anything agriculturally uh, related, but uh, back in the old days, they would, uh, in their fields, they would build up a mound in the middle, and they would put a flat uh, floor of stones on it. It was called the threshing floor, kind of like what you and I might think of as like an Indian burial mound. It was kind of a mound in the middle of a, of a plain where their fields would be. And that was a great place to thresh the wheat. They, the, stones were, or the stone floor was down here. They would take these forks and they would throw these, these uh, sheaves up into the air. And it would cause uh, the chaff to blow away. The chaff would be loosened every time it hit the stones. And it would blow away. And if you saw it from a distance, it almost looked like, a, like smoke was rising up from a campfire because of all the chaff that would be blowing uh, in the breeze. But you needed a breeze. And so you needed to kind of be up in a high place to thresh wheat. And, and Gideon is not in a high place. He's down in a very low place trying to thresh wheat. Why? Because he's scared. The children of Israel had stopped being obedient to God. And for seven years, God put them under submission to the Midianites. And the Midianites and the Amalekites were coming in and raiding at harvest time. They were just taking all the produce. 
Uh, might have been a couple of things that maybe they were thinking, hey, uh, maybe they had a famine in their own area and simply had to come up here and steal from somebody else and they, and they were strong enough to take it. Or perhaps they were just trying to come right in at harvest time and literally starve the Israelites out of existence and then they'd be able to take over their land uh, because they had both cities and farms in, in Midianite culture. So Gideon's afraid. And I want to talk about fear this morning because his actions were, were, were based upon fear and many of us make our decisions and we choose actions based on fear and there's a great danger in that. For example, the scripture says, the fear of man brings what? A snare. Have you ever been snared because you made a decision based on fear instead of based upon having a sound mind and thinking it through? So as we think about fear this morning, there's a few things I just want to lay down at the beginning. First of all, there's an inverse relationship between fear and trust. The greater your trust, the less your fear. The greater your fear, the less your trust. You see this in a marriage relationship, for example. So uh, as you learn to, to grow together and you learn to trust one another, your fears begin to go away. Um, same thing happens in a business relationship. You work together and, there, and there's trust. You grow together, you grow together. Now, what happens if somebody in the relationship does something to break that trust? Fear now creeps in to the relationship, whether it's a marriage relationship or a business relationship, and, and things get really tense all of a sudden whenever fear enters in, whenever trust goes away. So please understand that, and the same thing's true with our relationship with God. There's going to be this inverse relationship where either we're going to be afraid of things if we're not trusting God. The more we trust God, the less we'll fear the circumstances. Secondly, our trust in God is based upon His revealed character and nature. Why can you trust God? It's a good question. Well, you want to tell other people that they should trust God, they should trust Jesus as their Savior. Why should somebody trust God? Paul says in Romans that God's nature, his character is revealed in his creation. I was out here by the soccer field this morning standing between the bleachers and you could hear like a thousand different birds. I mean, they were just, I didn't see them flying around. They must have been in the bushes or, or hiding in the trees. But you could hear all these different birds just chirping, and everyone's making a different sound. And at first I didn't hear it. I heard cars going by. And then all of a sudden my, my ears just started picking up the sounds of the birds. And eventually I was tuning into the sounds of all these birds instead of listening to everything else that was going on. And it was amazing. And I thought, here it is Sunday morning, and all of creation is having a little praise and worship service right now. And these birds are just giving it everything they've got. And, 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 there, and you think about what is revealed about God, how powerful he is, how wise he is, how, how uh, just good he is to, to create such amazing things. So God's nature, his attributes, the fact that he's all powerful, the fact that he's all knowing, the fact that he's all present. This should help us as, as we evaluate, we look at God, we look at who he is and the character that's revealed through nature and through scripture about God. We say, all right, I, I, God's trustworthy. Part of God's redemptive plan and reconciliation is to restore our trust in Him. See, our trust was lost in the Garden of Eden when our first parents were deceived into not trusting God. Wasn't that the heart of the first temptation? Satan begins to question Eve in such a way as to undermine her trust in God. Had God done anything to ever cause a lack of trust? No. He was good. He met with them in the cool of the day. He gave them a great place to live. He gave them food to eat. But, but Satan comes in and he begins undermining this trust. Has God really said that, that, that? Well, well, God knows in the day that you eat, you will what? Will you really die? And he starts asking these questions. You, God knows you'll be wise. You'll be like the gods. He's holding out on you. And so what Satan is doing is he's undermining trust. Isn't that how he gets you and me today? His game hasn't really changed because it's that effective. I ultimately choose not to trust God's plan, God's will, God's word, and I choose my own way. The scripture puts it this way. All we like sheep have what? Gone, Gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own path. Instead of trusting the path of our shepherd, we have trusted our own path and gotten ourselves in a mess. Trust was lost in the Garden of Eden. It really, the fall of mankind into sin occurred because of a lack of trust. But our reconciliation is gained now by placing our trust in God again. It happened this morning in Latino uh, service. Somebody placed their trust 
in Christ. For by grace are you saved through faith. Faith, trust, it's, just, it's this placing of my trust. When you stand before God, when you get to heaven, if they have a, a check-in at the gate, and I don't think that's how it works, but if they do, and, and you've got to stop, and they say, why should you get in? What will you be trusting in at that moment? Well, I was a pretty good person. Paid my bills on time. I mean, April 15th just happened. I even got my taxes in ahead of that. Well, what are you, what are you going to trust in? I hope that you say, the only way I get in is if Christ's blood is enough to cover my sin. Amen, it's all about him. It's all about his righteousness. It's nothing that I've done. Nothing in my hands I bring. Only to the cross I claim. That trust being restored is a gift of God's grace. Let's turn now to this story of Gideon and, and how fear was, it was affecting Gideon's life. And fear is, I'm sure, affecting your life today, every one of us, because of this battle with trust and fear. And, and, and do, we, do we really trust God or do we trust something else? The children of Israel had begun to trust other gods. It says they were going after the gods of the Amorites, specifically the pagan deity Baal and the pagan goddess Asherah. And, and so that's what they were worshiping at this time. God had sent them some, some plagues, so to speak, some, some, some suffering to get their attention. Verse 7, if you want to turn in your Bibles, Judges chapter 6, we'll just read a little bit of this story. Judges chapter 6, it won't be on the screen up above, I don't think. Judges chapter 6 and verse 7, they cried out to the Lord because of Midian. Midian was this army of people that God had sent to oppress them. And the Lord sent a prophet to the Israelites and he said, This is what the Lord, the God of Israel says, I brought you out of slavery in Egypt. I rescued you from the Egyptians, from all who oppressed you. I drove out your enemies and gave you their land. I told you, I am the Lord your God. You must not worship the gods of the Amorites in whose land you now live. But you have not listened to me. They began trusting other gods. Then it says, The angel of the Lord came and sat beneath the great tree at Ophrah, which belonged to Joash of the clan of Abiezer. Gideon, the son of Joash, was threshing wheat at the bottom of the winepress to hide the grain from the Midianites. And the angel of the Lord appeared to him and said, Mighty hero, or mighty man of valor, the Lord is with you. How is fear affecting Gideon? First of all, his life's kind of at a standstill. Some of you are there. You're, you're fearful. You're making your decisions based on fear or you're reaping the consequences of making decisions based on fear. And life has kind of ground to a halt. Things are at a standstill and that's kind of how it was for Gideon. He's down in the bottom of a, of a wine press threshing wheat. It's not effective. The normal day-to-day -day operations had lost their efficiency. He's wasting time. He's wasting effort. It takes a lot more effort to thresh, wine, uh, to thresh wheat in a wine press than it does on a threshing floor. So he's becoming efficient. He's wasting time. He's wasting effort. And he's getting poor results. There's still a lot of chaff in the flour. The bread's not as good as it used to be. So his fear, his unwillingness to risk to get up out of that wine press and get up on the threshing floor, his unwillingness to risk and the fear that he's experiencing are causing these symptoms, if you will, in his life. Is fear affecting you in a similar way this morning? Uh, let me ask you, are, are you living or are you just existing? I mean, Christ calls us to live an abundant life. Galatians says it is for freedom that Christ has set you free to live a free and an abundant life in Christ. And, and I, I just want to ask, are, are, you, are you living that life that God's called you to live? Or is fear keeping you in check? Are you lacking efficiency? Is fear causing you to waste time, waste effort, and get poor results? When I make decisions based on fear, that's what happens to me. So why was he wasting time? Why was he getting poor results? It's because Gideon was afraid to lose what he had invested. You go out, you plant the seeds, you plant the crops. He didn't want to lose that. And for good reason. The Amalekites, the Amidianites, they were nearby. He didn't want to lose it. So what's he trusting in? Is he trusting in God? God, you know my family needs to eat. No, I'm going to hide down in this wine press and I'm just going to try to, to maintain. And he's living based on fear. He was afraid to lose that which he depended upon for sustenance. But, but, but was it really the grain that was sustaining Gideon? Is it really your job that sustains you? What do we trust in? 
The scripture puts it this way. Every good gift and every perfect gift comes from whom? Comes from God. My, my trust, your trust, it can't be in whatever's here. It has to be in God. We live life as a stewardship, not as an ownership, and we just say it's all in the open hands, God. Do with it what you will. What have you invested in that you're afraid to lose? You've put a lot of time and effort and energy into it, and you're afraid to lose it, so you hold on a little bit tighter. God, I can't let you have this. Well, what are you depending on that you don't want taken away? So you're holding it a little bit tighter, a little bit closer. Is there anything that you're saying, God, I just can't trust you with? Sometimes it's a relationship. Sometimes it's an employment situation. But, but we have these things that we think we're dependent on, and really our dependence should be on God. And what happens is the, the tighter that we hold these things, we start making our decisions based on fear. I must protect these things. I must protect this. I can't trust God to protect it. I've got to protect it. And the next thing you know, we find ourselves down in a wine press doing what we should be doing on a threshing floor. And we're inefficient. We're just kind of stuck because of fear. What's keeping you in the wine press this morning when you should be on a threshing floor? And let me ask this. Are you content with wasting time and effort and getting poor results so long as the risk seems less? God mercifully comes and he, he rescues Gideon out of this meager existence. He's like, you're living in fear. I've got a bigger job for you to do. You've got to get out of this place. Think about the parable of the talents. Three different people are given three different amounts of money. Then the master leaves and go on a, goes on a business trip. And he says, I expect a return on my investment when I get back. The guy who gets the most actually ends up risking the most. He risks it all and doubles it. The next guy, risks it all. But what about that last guy? The scripture says that he, when the master comes back, he, he goes and he digs it out of a hole in the ground and he says, I know that you reaped where you didn't sow, and I was afraid. I was afraid. So did he risk it? No, he put it in the ground. And he said, here, at least I didn't lose anything. He was unwilling to risk. His fear cost him. And then what did the master do? All right, I'll take this from you, and I'm going to give it to this person over here. Don't live your life based on fear. Let me ask this question. What about God would change? If you got out of the wine press and walked up to the, fr to, th to the threshing floor. Is there anything about God that would change? Not a thing. See, God is just as sovereign. Whether you live in fear or not. You're the one who needs to change. I'm the one who needs to change. Didn't change for God. He's still on his throne. God was just as much on his throne when Gideon was down in the wine press as when Gideon was blowing the trumpets and the guys were breaking the pots at the end of the story and the lights were shining and the Amalekites and the Midianites killed each other. God's sovereignty didn't change one bit, but Gideon's perspective changed throughout the story. It took a lot of encouragement. Yeah, Gideon was fearful. He kept saying, God, oh, you got to help me out. You got to give me a sign. You got to help me here. You got to let me know. Hey, can we blame Gideon? Would you go into battle against an untold multitude with 300 guys unless you knew for sure that God was going to... I would want, some, I would want a fleece to be dry or he, I think he heard some, a dream about a barley cake that rolled down the hill and wiped out a bunch of tents. Hey, I would look for some things like that too. Let's not knock Gideon. He makes it into the Faith Hall of Fame. Yeah, it's okay. If sometimes you say, God, if this is your will, I'm putting it in the open hands. I'm willing to risk, but you got to show me because I don't want to make a dumb decision. I don't want to charge off into a battle and you not be with me. Not a thing about God would change if you lived on the threshing floor instead of the wine press, but you would change. Here's the problem, and it's a problem for you, and it's a problem for me. Gideon knew God was capable. He just didn't know if God was willing or not. In the story, as you drop down a few verses, uh, the angel says, hey, you're this mighty man of valor. And in verse 13, Gideon says, well, if God is really with us, then why is all this bad stuff happening to us? I mean, I've heard about the great stories. 
All the cool stuff that God did in the past and the lightning bolts and the, the river parting and all. I've heard about all that, but what about me? I know God's capable, but is God willing? Have you had that same doubt in your life? Man, I sure have. Have you ever gone to a prayer meeting and somebody talks about all the great answers to prayer they got? And you got nothing? And you're like, God, I know you're, I know you're able, but are you willing to answer this thing? Are you going to step in and intervene in my life? Well, let's look at what this encouragement did because this angel of the Lord offered some great encouragement to Gideon and I think that you'll find that it's going to be a good encouragement to us today. What did this encouragement do for Gideon? First of all, the encouragement declared God's presence. The angel says to Gideon, the Lord is with you. All right, the Midianites and the Amalekites are not going to beat God, Gideon. And God is with you. You're safe. God is with you. Secondly, it affirmed Gideon's value. They called him a mighty man of valor. Now, he's hiding in a wine press, threshing wheat, and the, and the angel of the Lord says, you're a mighty man of valor. Now, there's one of two things. Either maybe God just saw something in Gideon that, that Gideon didn't see in himself. I think that's part of it. God's like, hey, you're a mighty man. You may not see it. Or perhaps in, 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 in the... In the, in the uh, in the rabbinical uh, tradition of Gideon, he had been in the past a mighty man of valor. He's probably about 40, and he had already won some battles, and, and, and he had just kind of lost his way and, and not really become much of a warrior. And, and God's reminding him, no, you're a mighty man of valor. And some of you, you've had victories in the past, and, and now you're, you're living in fear. I've been there. I've had great victories, and then the next thing you know, I'm living in fear, and I'm making my decisions based upon fear. But this angel affirms his value. Doesn't it feel good when your value is affirmed? Thirdly, this, this, this encouragement helps him to overcome his obstacles towards trust. Because Gideon had some obstacles. But, but this Gideon, God's going to be with you. You're a mighty man of valor. You're going to go do it. It helped him to overcome the obstacles that he was putting there. Fourthly, it articulated his purpose. You shall defeat the Midianites. Having purpose and having direction helps overcome fear. I can prove it. This is how I learned how to dive. And everybody remember standing on the edge of a pool? All right? And so I'm not going to do it because there's not a pool. All right? But so I would stand there and my buddies were all like, come on, do it, man. It's easy. You just do it. You know? And they were all good at it. We didn't have a pool. I hardly ever went swimming because like back, back in those days, I grew up as a fundamentalist and you weren't allowed to do mixed bathing, which sounds creepy anyway. Uh, but, uh, you know, you weren't allowed to. Do, so, so I hardly ever went to the pool. Our youth pastor called the pool, the, the community pool, the cesspool of iniquity. That's how he referred to it. So I never went swimming and I'm, I'm like scared to death to try to dive. And the first time, a couple times I tried, belly smacker, right? It hurts really bad. And then I got even more scared. I didn't want to do it. Then finally, somebody brought an inner tube over and they, they just floated the inner tube right out in front of me. And they said, just dive through that. Bloop, right through. Having direction helped me overcome fear. Yeah. And I think the same thing happens with a lot of us. When we don't really know where we're going, we don't really know what we're doing, the fear kind of paralyzes us. But whenever we have some direction, it's finally like, okay, I can get overcome this thing now. The angel helped him articulate his, by articulating the purpose. You shall defeat the Midianites. You're called to something, Gideon. And finally, it inspired bold action. Aren't you impressed with people who take bold action? I am. Not bold action, guys. Bold action. Okay? <laughs> you got to go tear down some idols? This was bold action. Gideon had to go to his father's backyard, tear down an altar to Baal, cut down a, what's called an Asherah pole, like kind of a telephone pole, was one of their idols. They had to cut up the, uh, the telephone pole, use it as the wood for the fire, and offer a sacrifice to the Lord on the new altar. The next day, all the men of the town come out. They're like, who, who messed up Baal's altar? Who cut down the pole? And they start asking questions, and sure enough, they find out it was Gideon. He, he did it at night with a few of his buddies. Because again, he didn't overcome his fear all at once. But at least he obeyed. And so then they were going to kill him, and Gideon's dad stepped in. I mean, the guy had an idol in his backyard, but his dad steps up and he says, well, why are you guys going to kill Gideon? Can't Baal kill him? I mean, let's let Baal fend for himself. And from that day on, they actually nicknamed Gideon Jerubal, which means let Baal defend him. 
The guy, I mean, he had a new t-shirt, a new nickname. Cool name. Let Baal speak. Let Baal step up. If Baal's big enough, let him do it. This angel's encouragement inspired Gideon towards bold action to tear down the idols and then to take risks that really weren't risk. If God says, take 300 men and go defeat the uh, Midianites, is it really a risk? Th does God call people to do stuff and then pull the chair out from under them and back up and let them, let them crash and burn? No, it's a risk that isn't a risk. When you're following God, it's not really a risk. When, when my oldest sister became a missionary in Africa, mom and dad had to go through this. All right, how, are we going to let our kid go to Africa? And then finally they came to this decision. It's not really a risk. Kim's is safe in Africa in the center of God's will than she'd be anywhere else. It's a risk that isn't really a risk after all. Every one of us deals with fear, and every one of us needs some encouragement too. And I want you to walk away this morning encouraged with the following things. First of all, the Lord is with you. Do you realize that Jesus, on the authority of Jesus, he said to his disciples, and lo, I am with you just for a little while, even to the end of the age. I will, oh, you will not go anywhere that Jesus isn't going with you. The Holy Spirit is, is with you. He goes with you everywhere you go. And so this morning, you should be encouraged, whatever fears you have, whatever situation, you should be encouraged that you are not facing it alone. Just like Gideon said, I can go face the, the Midianites because God's facing the Midianites. You can face whatever it is. And I hope that you're encouraged this morning by the very fact that God has promised he will never leave you or forsake you. He is with you always till the end of the age. Secondly, I want you to be encouraged because of your value. I want your value to be affirmed this morning. Jesus said, God knows when a sparrow falls in the wilderness, and you are worth way more than sparrows. Your value is massive to God. Enough that he sent Christ to die in your place for your sin that he might reconcile you to himself. He pays a massive price. Your value is very high to God. I hope that this morning as you think about the fact that God is with you and you think about that, that God, you are valued, that, that it helps begin to overcome some obstacles towards trust. And I want to tell you what David would do. The psalmist would always look back at ways that God had helped him in the past. And that gave him strength for the present and it gave him hope for the future. And so if you're in kind of one of those seasons where you're like, I, I know God's willing, but is he going to, I mean, I know he's, I can, but is he going to help? Has he helped you in the past? Yeah. Does he care about you in the present? Yeah. Are you going to have hope for the future? Yeah, you can have hope for the future now. Also, you have a divine purpose. I have a divine purpose. The scripture says this in Ephesians 2, 8, 9, and 10. For by grace you are saved through faith. It's not of yourselves. It's the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. But the next verse says this. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto Good works, which he has before ordained that we should walk in them. God does have a plan for your life. He has fashioned you for a specific task. Just as Gideon's task was, you go liberate the Israelites from the Midianites. You have a divine task. When you walk into the room, Jesus walks in the room with you. When you go into a family conflict, Jesus goes into the conflict with you. you you're there to bring his peace. You're there to bring his love. You're there to, to share the message of the gospel everywhere you go. You and I have a divine purpose. It is to go into all the world and preach the gospel, to be the image of Christ to a world that needs to see what God is like. And lastly, I hope this morning that you will be inspired to take bold action. Some of you need to take down some idols in your life. About 10 years ago, I was meditating and, and thinking through this passage of Gideon. And, and I realized in our family, in that situation, we, I realized that television was for us was becoming a bit of an idol. It was taking up too much of our time. It was causing inefficiency. We were just spending way too much time sitting around looking at a square thing. And so what we decided to do is for one year, we're just going to pull the plug on cable. Best year ever. I don't know why we ever got it back. I know why we got it back because I like basketball and I, was watch, I wanted to watch March Madness. All right. But, uh, uh, but we took a whole year off, didn't watch it. Man, the blessing of getting that idol out. So you got an idol. Probably you got something in your life that if I mentioned it, you'd say, you can't take that away. I mean, the squares just got smaller. Right? 
I mean, some, some of you cannot be more than a foot away from your phone at any time ever. Some of you are addicted to Facebook. Some of you are addicted to video games. Just all these, they're, they're idols in your life. They're just slowing you down, wasting your time. I hope that this morning you would be inspired and encouraged to take bold action and get these idols out of your life. And, and then lastly, I hope that you would be encouraged this morning to start taking risks that are not risk at all. If God's calling you to do it, it's not a risk. In fact, you're going to get a reward for it. It's a very small thing. The one who sows sparingly, how do they reap? The one who sows bountifully, how do they reap? Bountifully. It's the principle of sowing and reaping. You were called, and I am called, to be more than a wine press warrior. We've got to get out of there. We've got to stop living in fear. And we've got to live our life dependent upon God. And I'm just praying today, as you walk out these doors, that you'll walk out encouraged. I'm a child of God. His presence is with me. I have a divine purpose in this world, and I'm going to fulfill it. And Satan can't stop me. Nothing can stop me. I'm going to do it. Father, as we go out these doors... Lord, I know that there are people this morning struggling with fear in their life. And Lord, you have not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and love and a sound mind. Lord, I pray that you would do a work by your spirit because I know that there's people sitting in this room right now that are saying, I just can't shake the fear. I just can't seem to trust God. So, Lord, I pray that by your Holy Spirit, you would do a work in my life, in their life. Do, do a work in us collectively. Encourage us by your Holy Spirit. Show us our value. Lord, give us our purpose. Give us our direction. Lord, increase our trust. Decrease our fears. Do that for me. Do that for each one of us this morning, please, Lord. We believe that we are asking for that which Christ himself would ask in our behalf. And so we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. There are forms in, in church culture. We would say it used to be simple. It used to just be about carrying your cross and following Jesus. That was really what it was about. And so people would get together if they could in a weekly setting. And of course, when it was...